The Gospel of Luke records in chapter 2, verse 1, In those days a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This was the first registration when Quirinius was governor of Syria. And all went to be registered, each to his own town. And Joseph also went up to Galilee, from the town of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed, who was a child. And while they were there, the time came for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. Will you join me to pray? God, I pray right now for clarity of thought and heart and spirit as we come before you. I pray your word will be alive unto us. God, I pray that you'd break through the haze of snow and the winter doldrums. God, that you'd cause us to be vibrant alive with the joy of Christ this day. We pray, God, that, Lord, your day spring light would shine anew and afresh in us as we come close to you. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Not many of us remember the events of 1865. I'm going to go on a limb and say that many of you were here during that time. Right? 1865 was the, was the ending of the Civil War. It was where that war where brother was pitted against brother nation was divided. And there was a long and bitter conflict. And I won't go through the whole history lesson, but you and I know from even our times in elementary and high school the devastation that went on as a result of this war that took place. And the country itself was going through a time of mourning, a time of healing. And then on April 14th, tragedy happened. It was the day that President Lincoln was assassinated. A few short days later, his body is interned in, in presidential estate and is touring the nation so people can give their condolences and, and mourn. Thousands upon thousands were packed together in the city of Philadelphia on April 23rd. They were so tight together, people were pressed together, people were fainting and unable to fall to the ground because bodies next to them were holding together because everyone was trying to get close to pay their respects to the great president, Abraham Lincoln. And it was on this day, in this challenge, that the pastor, Phillips Brooks, came and had to give the eulogy for the president. Can I just stop you for a moment? And, and, and I don't know if you can sit in my shoes just for a moment. Having to do a eulogy for a family that you know and, and you love, Kara, is it, it, hard enough. But imagine doing it for thousands upon thousands of people gathered together for the President of the United States. And so that was where Pastor Phil Brooks was at. He gave what probably one of the best eulogies ever. And if you look up his writings, he has his books, Letter to the President, Letter on Travels proficient author at those times, he tells the, the whole process that's there. His love and adoration, he was a strong abolitionist himself, and so he strongly sided the North. So this had a profound impact on him and for the much of the country for that Easter time. And you say, well, Pastor, what does that have to do with the little town of Bethlehem? Well, you see, just like the war had taken its toll on the nation, it had taken its toll on Phil Brooks as well. He was worried and, and saddened by the recent loss of his president and also the, just the, the weight of ministry during those times. And so in order to rejuvenate himself and his ministry, he decided to take a tour in the following year to the Holy Land. Now back then, it's not like the cruise ships that you and I have today or airplane travels where you can be gone for a week and you're back in a couple of days. This was a six to seven month journey that he endeavored on. So he went on this journey and he actually found himself outside the town of Bethlehem on Christmas Eve. He was riding the, the donkeys going up to the village and he could hear the carols from the English churches ringing out across the, the countryside as he was gathering in. The old traditional carols that you and I are all familiar with. And it was in that moment that a melody was sparked in his own life, in his own heart. And a couple years later, he would go on with the help of another prisoner. They would go and they would write this song, O Little Town of Bethlehem. And so maybe you can hear a little bit of that transition, a little bit of that hope string again. If I could just read to you this morning, but he and Lewis Redner came together to form the old little town of Bethlehem. We just sang it. It's the little town of Bethlehem. How still we see thee lie. Above thy deep and dreamless sleep, the silent stars go by. Yet in the dark streets shineth the everlasting light. And if I could focus you on this last part. The hopes and fears of all the years are met in me tonight. 
For man searching at that moment, it was pivotal to be reminded once again that the advent of the Christ child not only interrupted time, but could also interrupt his life as well. And maybe you're here today and you would be looking through this last 2016 and saying, it's been a rough year. It's been a bad year. Maybe you're facing this moment and you just, I don't even know what next year is going to be. Maybe you're at a place in your own life where you're in the spiritual doldrums and you're wondering, is there any hope in this moment? Is there any way that I can get past this and move forward? And I want to encourage you today that there is still hope. That the everlasting light still shines in the darkness. And the darkness has not overcome it. Christmas morning still shines brightly with the gospel message of why Jesus came. That He came to seek and save that was lost to undo the schemes and the powers of the enemy and rise triumphantly to redeem all of humanity. That's our hope. That's our message through Christmas. And so I want to just challenge you, if I could just encourage you and just, just, just shout words of joy into your life today. There's still hope. And maybe you're saying, hey, Pastor, look, I'm all merry and jingle and bright myself. I mean, things are going, this is a wonderful year. Well, good. Let that go out to those around you. Let the light shine. Let your love flow. Let the joy overcome. Amen? That hope still shines. That passage that we just read and in this, the song that we sang this carol comes from the passage found in Micah chapter 5, verses 2 through 5. It'll be our passage for this morning, so if you want to follow in your Bibles or follow on the version or on the screen behind me, you can do that. In Math, I'm sorry, Micah, Micah chapter 5, verse 2, it says this, But you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you shall come forth for me one who is to be ruler in Israel, whose coming forth is from old, from ancient days. Therefore he shall give them up until the time when she is in labor is to give birth, and the rest of his brothers shall return to the people of Israel. And he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, and the majesty of the name of the Lord is God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. There's a lot in that passage, isn't there? And, I, and the challenge I face as a pastor every year coming to Christmas is how do I make this new and fresh and engaging? Right? A little town of Bethlehem probably isn't a song that you sing any other time of the year. Right? I doubt in July you're singing this song. Right? You, th- you save it, we put it away, we have a little category for it, it's called Christmas carols, and we break it out after Thanksgiving, because if you do it before, you get yelled at. I'm telling you, I tried. Okay? <laughs> we sing it after, and then as soon as New Year's Eve ha- hits, boom, we're done singing carols. Just, we shelf this away for another year. But don't let that be. Amen? As I, as I looked at this passage, there's three things I want to bring out to you, if I could. Th- some things I want to share with you that maybe be encouraging to you. The first is this. God chose Bethlehem. I, I don't know if that catches you at all, but the fact that God purposely picked in and, and, and chose Bethlehem may be the place where His divine plan that he began at the beginning of the world, right? Before all of creation, he set this place apart. He chose Bethlehem. Have you ever lived in a town that you can't find on the map? I'm not talking about Google Maps, because you can zoom in with Google Maps all the way to see your neighbor's dog in the pool next door, right? But does anyone else find it a little exasperating when you try to tell somebody where Marengo is located? Right? I say, okay... You, you know where Woodstock's at? Right? No. Do you know where Chicago's at? Yeah, you know where Rockford's at? Yeah, we're in between Chicago and Rockford, right? Right. Last night, I'm watching three weather reports. I'm trying to make this final decision how we're going to affect this, the, the, the services today. And Marengo's not showing up on any of the winter radars. I have to kind of guess where, you know, you know, McHenry and Boone County lines are at. I have to kind of say, okay, this is where, and, and we're trying to extrapolate. It, it doesn't show up on the map. You try to help people understand, well, there's a couple of landmarks. Find adjoining cities, and finally you just say, you know where the northern state of Illinois is at? Right? We're, we're good there, right? The problem is that sometimes we apply that thinking to our own lives. We give reference to our lives by way of comparison 
and we never seem to measure up. Or we measure our expectations by what we've perceived by the potential of our surroundings. People look at us and we try and tell them, well, did you have this happen in your life? Have, has this occurred in your life? And, or maybe we'll look at somebody and say, oh, man, they've got it so good and we went to school together and now look where they're at, look where I'm at. And we make this comparison and we begin to diminish for a moment We diminish the call of God on our lives. And I want to just challenge you today. Here's this incredible thought. If I could get you to take hold of this morning, God chose Bethlehem, and in the same way, God has chosen you. God has a purpose and a calling for each person in this room. And the problem right now is I I can tell you because I'm watching your faces this morning. This is not a television screen, right? I can see you. You can see me, right? As soon as I said that, many of you looked at somebody else in the room. You didn't even think about it. You're thinking, oh, now who did I look at? Right? But you did a lot. God chose you, and you go, it has a plan for your life. You're like, oh, yeah, that person over there. The person next to me. I really, there's nothing good can come out of my life. I've kinda, I'm at the end of my life. I already made my choices for my life. This is the way things go, and this is it. This is it. But God says, but you, O Bethlehem Ephrathah, you who are too little to be among the clans of Judah, you who are so small, you don't even show up on the map, out of you shall come for me. The one I have chosen. God says, I picked someone to move in and through your life. God has picked you to be a vessel that Jesus Christ can work through. He has chosen you. Well, no, 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 Pastor. He only chooses the big people. No, no, listen to what some verses have to say about that. Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 6, it says this, For you are a people to the Lord. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for His treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth, God has chosen you as a treasured possession. Well, you're saying, well, Pastor, no, no, that's in the Old Testament. That's only for Israelite people. Well, by way of faith and by principle, we can include you in that. But in case you can't follow that, let's go to Ephesians chapter 1. Verses 3 through 6, it says this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who's blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before Him. In love, He predestined us for adoption to Himself as sons to Jesus Christ according to the purpose of His will. To the praise of His glorious grace, which He has blessed us in the Beloved. Did you catch that? God chose you. God chose you before the world began. Did you catch that part in Micah chapter 5 where God says this, that from you is coming forth one who is from old, from the ancient days? Maybe the snow maybe got in your ears a little bit this morning. Maybe you missed this incredible thought. God has chosen to move in your life. Your life is not done. Your life is not sidetracked. Your life is not spent. God can still move through you. This holiday season isn't over yet. Right? God can still move in you and through you. God wants to move through you. First Peter 2 9 says this, but you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. You cannot tell me this morning that God has not chosen you. You cannot tell me in any realm of faith that God has passed you up for someone else. God wants to move through you. Oh, little Bethlehem, you're so small among the nations, you don't even show up on the map, but God can move through you. But you, Morango, you don't even show up on the weather radar. But God can move through you, right? God can move incredibly in and through you. God has plans for you. And I can't help but catch on this little little thing that, that, that God does here in Micah chapter 5. He calls it Bethlehem Ephrata, which means really simply, House of bread abundant. Okay? But out of you, a oh, house of bread abundant, something's going to happen. Now, has anybody ever been to Green Bay? Right? It's sickening, isn't it? Right? 
everything is green and yellow up there. Right? Everything is green and yellow everywhere, and there's a lot of packing companies up there. Right? Anybody? But you, I'm not lying. I'm not making this up. That's the way it is. You know what you find in Wisconsin? What do, you, what do people go to Wisconsin for? Look, you even, I didn't have to even help you on that one. We go to, it's for cheese, right? It's, it's Green Bay, it's green and yellow, and there's cheese, right? So when you go to Wisconsin, you work with me, I'm getting, going somewhere with this, okay? When you go to Wisconsin and you order a cheeseburger, right? Do you expect the cheese on it to be better quality than what you're going to get in Illinois? Right? Even though they ship it down from Wisconsin, we still expect it to be better, right? The cheese curds in Wisconsin, they're going to be better, aren't they? Right? If you went to Wisconsin and they and you went to a restaurant and they said, we don't serve cheese here, you go, what are you doing? Are you with me? If you, if you were in Green Bay, you would not see too many buildings that are blue and orange. Right? There are no bear processing plants there, right? They're all packing plants. <laughs> Bethlehem Ephrata, this, this town of abundant bread, I don't know how many bakeries there were actually in there. I mean, when you think of Bethlehem, you're not thinking bread. You're not thinking that there's going to be anything abundant. You look at it from the outside, you're going... You look at it now, it's a quaint little village. It has the rolling hillside. It looks wonderfully, but you're not thinking house of bread. Are, are you with me? God's looked at your life, and He's called out wonderful things. He's called you His treasured possession, a people of His own choosing, a royal priesthood. And you look at your life, and you say, there's no cheese here. Right? I, I don't feel chosen. I don't feel treasured. I, I'm looking at my life. I'm not seeing it. But that doesn't take away from the fact that God has called it out of you. And what I love about this, and, and this is the part that I thought was really kind of neat. This is just me doing my theological geek out for a moment, okay? Bethlehem of Prata, this little town, small as the clans of Judah, no known bakery. It's not known for its bread, Right? But out of Bethlehem comes this one. This, this, out of the lineage of David, this, this child. His name is Jesus. And he says this in John chapter 6, verse 35. Jesus said to them, I am the bread of life. Oh, you catch that? That's pretty cool, isn't it? I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Jesus came to fulfill all the promises of God in your life. Jesus came for you, who has been chosen by God, to fulfill all your longing, all your desire, all your hopes, all your ambitions. They are met in Jesus Christ. All the hopes, and all the dreams of all the years are met in day tonight. Are you catching that this morning? You're here today and you say, Oh God, you said that I was going to be ministering to the nations and I just don't, I'm not, I don't have the public stage, I'm not doing any of that stuff. And God says, Hey look, it's not about you, it's about me. And I can bring it about, I can do the wondrous things. Right? So stop and think about this. And this is the part, maybe, if I can get you just to stretch just a little bit. It's going to be a little crazy for you, but just if you work with me. Jesus was actually not a loaf of bread. Right? You, I, mean, I mean, some of you, that's, a little, that's deep, right? You go, Jesus just said he was the bread of life, and Bethlehem supposed to be the house of abundant bread, and Jesus, he's not a loaf. He, he came a little bit differently than we anticipated. Are you with me? Maybe that's the message of Christmas, is that God's choosing to move in you and through you is not contained or limited by the way you think He should. Maybe God can move in your circumstances in a way that you don't quite see it just yet. Right? I'm sure Mary went around telling everybody she had a little butt in the oven. I, I tried. I just... 
<laughs> right? Some of you are like, ah, oh, crap, right? Some of you are just getting it now. <laughs> but God has something so much more than what we could just perceive. You've heard me say this before. The scripture says, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no eyes even entered in the heart of man. What well, God has in store for those who love you. And God only does it just a little bit. You know, Jesus, He didn't say, I am the, the one loaf of life. Right? I'm just a single slice of bread. Right? He says, I'm the bread of life. Whoever eats of me will never... Th-. That sounds like a... I, I never hunger again. That sounds like an abundant supply of bread, doesn't it? It sounds like a fulfillment, O Bethlehem, of Fratha, out of you shall come the one who is of ancient of days. Right? Out of you something great shall come. And I want to just challenge you if I can this morning. First of all, God's picked you. He's chosen you. And God can bring it about. Probably the biggest trouble we have in Pentecostal slash charismatic circles is that when we hear God speak into our lives, we hear the promises and we hear the things that God spoke into, speaks into our lives, that we try and make it happen on our own. We try and be, I'm called to be house of bread abundantly. I'm going to be that, right? Are you with me? But I'm going to be whatever. No, no. It's not about you. It's about Him. It's in Jesus Christ the promises are fulfilled. Amen? So maybe the day you're wondering, well, Pastor, how do I make that happen? How do I let that realize in my life? So I want to just challenge you three simple things this morning in closing. How you can allow God to reign in your life in such a way that His calling and His power can move in and through your life. Are you ready? Three things it says there at the end of Micah chapter 2 that we just read. I'm sorry, chapter 5, verses 2 through 5. First of all, this, he says, and he shall stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, and the majesty of the name of the Lord is God. And they shall dwell secure, for now he shall be great to the ends of the earth, and he shall be their peace. First thing is this. You want to begin to see this begin to happen in your life? You've got to allow God to be your shepherd. You know, I mean, it sounds so simple, doesn't it? He says he will shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord. Sheep are dumb. Sheep move in a straight line. They just keep walking. That's why shepherds have to constantly keep turning them around and keeping them in the flock. Sheep will take the grass down into the ground. They will just burn the ground out, right? So the shepherd has to keep leading them and guiding them. They can't stay in one area, right? Have you ever had to deal with an unruly kid or unruly dog or cat, right? And you're constantly like, come on now, come on. One day our cat way back in Colorado, got involved with a skunk. Yeah, you can imagine what happened. Well, I didn't know any better. I've always had dogs growing up. I thought, well, when a dog gets a skunk, you just take him and you put him in the bathtub and you wash him down. That cat was so unruly, so disrespectful to me. I took that cat and I had a leash. I don't ask me how I had a cat leash because I thought maybe leashes work for dogs, leashes would work for cats. That cat would, when, you know, you hear the yo-yo trick, you walk the dog. I, I created one called Drag the Cat because my cat, I would hook it up to the cat, you know, on his collar, and the cat would just go and I'd be dragging it. Right? Same thing happened. I put the cat in the bathtub, and the cat didn't realize what was going on at first until I took the leash and I tied it around the valve stem, and I had like this pulley system going on. And so with one hand, I'm pulling like a chain cord, right? I'm pulling on, you know, the and I got the, the shower going, and it is like the Tasmanian devil is in my bathtub. He's just, he, he is not allowing himself to get clean, right? Now, that's a real, uh, you know, kind of funny anecdote story. Eventually, what we did is we took the cat to the vet and said, you deal with him, and they knocked him out, washed him, threw him in a pile of clothes or a pile of towels and just left him in the room till he dried off. And he shredded the towels. It was, he was mad, right? How often do we respond to God the same way? You know, we like to think that as adults we don't have temper tantrums, but you do. You've learned to disguise them and, and call them by different names, you know. I'm having a fit right now, or, you know, I'm having some me time, I don't want an adult, whatever you want to say, right? Okay? 
But there's that time when you have to come underneath the yoke of the shepherd. So there's that time when you have to allow God to shepherd you in His strength, to lead you and to guide you, to, to go by the way He would lead you. Well, I'm not done eating here yet. Well, if I let you keep eating here, you're going to kill the grass and we're never going to be able to come back here, sheep. We've got to move you along. We as people, we want to camp out at the last word that God has for us. We want to camp out at this last revelation and we'll just gnaw the stubs into the very ground. And God says, no, no, I, I want to keep you moving along. i got greener pastures for you. i got a better place. Follow me. But you have to be willing, don't you? Don't be the cat that has to be dragged. Be like a sheep that's led. Allow God to shepherd you. Second is, allow God to be king. Can I, can I just say this? Quit putting God up to vote. You know, quit, quit putting God in a position where, God, if you don't do this for me, I'm going to start, I'm going to, I'm going to check the polls and we're going to go with another candidate. I'm going to be that other candidate. Right? Because there's only a place for one person on the throne of your life. And it's either going to be you, God, or someone, or something else. And when God gets there and God makes a rule or a judgment that you don't like, it's very easy in your natural self to say, I don't like that ruling. I don't like that decision. I'm going to go somewhere else. I'm going to go to the next door kingdom. Right? Or I'm going to, I want to vote for somebody else. We're going to have a mutiny. We're going to do whatever it takes to dispose this king just momentarily until he comes up with something I like, and then we'll put him back on the throne. Kings don't work that way. Did you know that? Majesty doesn't work that way. Majesty is either majesty or it's not. That sounds kind of weird, but what I mean is, is you're either king or you're not. You're not a sub-vassal. You're not a co-regent king. You're either king ruling or you're a servant. You catch that? That means that you have to make a decision in your faith walk if you're going to allow God to be king. And sometimes kings make rules and decrees that don't make any sense to where you're at. But because of where he's at and because of his vantage point, because where he can see the big picture, he can make that call for you. As parents, you understand that. You, right? As parents, can you not see what happens when your kids have too much sugar? Three of you, right? I have a jar full of candy I give to Cassie's and Zach's and, and kids on a regular basis. They're, they avoid my well, they don't avoid my office, but Cassie and Zach and Tay and Jake, they try and keep you know, the little ones, you know, Harper and Brielle and, and Mike and Zeke, they try to keep them out of my office because I, I like giving them candy now. I, I'm a pusher, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> you know, they come expectantly. They're like, woohoo, right? Mom and grandma and grandpas, you don't care about that rule, do you? Right? Mom and Dad, you care about that rule, right? Because you know what's going to happen if you take little Johnny, little Susie home, pump full of sugar. Because you know, right? You know what the end result's going to be. That's a funny one. But you, you know down the road there's decisions that kids make, that youth make. And you say, hey, look, I, you don't want to do this. If you go down this road, you're going to hurt yourself. I'm speaking from personal experience. Well, I've seen it. I've seen it. Somebody's like, you don't want to do that. But how many people know they've got to make that decision, Right? God's speaking into your life. He's speaking in my life. And you have to make a decision whether or not you're going to let Him speak. You're going to listen to the voice of the King. If the King will, as the Scripture says, have your ear, or are you going to turn to another? And lastly is this. Allow God to be your peace. Peace is the absence of conflict. And maybe today you need to quit fighting. Quit struggling. You think, well, Pastor, I, I love God. I would never, I would never do anything against Him. I'm not declaring war. I'm at, there's that point in our lives as, as believers that peace, or the absence of peace, happens when we're just unsettled and we won't allow God to. to you know, we, we've heard God speak. We recognize His lordship and position, but we just haven't agreed to it yet. We're still fighting with it a little bit, right? We're still struggling with it just a little bit. I mean, if you stop and think about Pastor Phillips Brooks once again, there, here they are at the Civil War, and, and things are just going bad, right? The, 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 the North won. 
the slaves are free, but you know, and as well, I know that took, that took a long, long time before that, and, and we're still sowing the seeds, or reaping the harvest of those seeds, so, right? So that, we, that whole process, that, that took a toll. And you could easily say, you know, that's just it, I'm done. You know, we're just going to have to go through this whole process of the restoration of America. Man, it's, it's hard work. People were giving up. Suicide rates were skyrocketing. The North had won. The war was over and people were dying still. You know, let's just be real. The election is over. The vote's been cast. The things are done. And wherever you fall in that whole process, it's done. It's over. And whether you're on the winning side or the losing side, there are people right now who have no hope. Aimless, I don't know. And it's easy to poke fun and say, ah, you losers, you backed the wrong candidate. Or, oh, you losers, you voted for the wrong guy. I'm trying to get both sides to it, right? It's easy to not be settled with the results. But Paul says, I've learned to be content in all things, with little or with much. I've learned to be content when things are going great and when things are going bad, when I've been well fed and when I've been starving, when I've been warm and when I've been freezing cold. I've learned to be content. He says this in the midst of a Roman emperor who has declared war on Christianity. And the Caesars that would follow him would do just the same. And Paul says, I'm content. See, there's a lot of folks today that you're doing good with family, you're doing good with friends, there's no tragedies, praise God, there's no calamities, nothing's missing, nothing's going wrong, but you are just unrestful. You're empty, you're angry, you're frustrated. You're just not at peace. And I want to just challenge you, if I could, that Jesus Christ is here to give you peace. That He's here to be the answer to what you're longing for, what you're trying to strive for. You allow Him to let that peace of past His understanding be guard your heart and your mind. But in all three areas, you have to make a decision. Will you allow him to be shepherd? Will you allow him to be king? Will you allow him to be your peace? It may be possible for you to understand today that maybe God's chosen you to be where you're at so that his grace and his majesty could be on display for you. Think about that. Instead of bemoaning the situation you're in, maybe, maybe you're there in that moment to be God's trophy case. To say that in this moment, my child, my daughter can still thrive. Even though all the world seems to be going to, you know, melting away around her or him, I can still move. Right? In fact, let me close with the, the, one of the stanzas from our little town once again. How silently, how silently, the wondrous gift is given. So God imparts to human hearts the blessing of this heaven. No ear may hear his coming, but in this world of sin, where meek souls will receive him still, the dear Christ enters in. How silently this wondrous gift is given. This little town of Bethlehem, nobody saw it coming. At the advent of his birth, Several years later, King Harold will be asking, where is this child? Where is this king of the Jews to be born? And they have to scour the records for this reference to find out. And I just want to, I just think, maybe just to me, I've always felt God likes the underdogs. I always felt like God likes the ones that no one thinks anything can come out of their life. I think God sometimes, and this is just way speaking, so I think sometimes God likes the challenge. Not like it's difficult to Him, but like if you say, hey, look, God, I don't think you can move in my life. It's a dead-end place. God says, oh, you want to bet? 
And maybe you're here. Maybe if I can just speak to one person this morning, and you're saying, I don't know if anything could ever come out of my life. It's just so small. It's so inconsequential. It's just, it's not even showing up on the radar. And I want to challenge you. God has a plan for you that He chose you from the very beginning of the world. To ancient days, He has a plan for you if you allow Him to enter in. Amen? Actually, this just pray where you're at, just stand up. You've been sitting for a while. I don't want you to get frozen and get stiff before you go outside, right? question to God, what can you do with my life? Go ahead and ask me. Don't wait for somebody ask it for you. This is like, God, what can you do with my life? And when I want to help you out. If you hear the word do nothing, that's a lie. That's not God. That's probably you. Right? The enemy's not part of this discussion. So this morning, what can God do with your life? Allow the dreams, allow the visions, the, the, the promises of God to just overwhelm you for a moment that you are not forgotten, you are not neglected, you're not placed off in the backwoods to be never seen from again, but God has a purpose and a choosing for you, that out of you can come an abundance that you never had on your own, that you could never do on your own, that Jesus Christ has come to be your shepherd, to be your king, to be your peace, to be more than you could ever imagine on your own, if you would but let him this morning. Father God, I thank you for the incredible love that you have for each person in this room. I thank you, Lord, that no person is a mistake and no person is a surprise. That you knew every one of us in this room from the very beginning of time. So, Lord, I pray may we have faith today to receive the fresh vision and hope that you have for every person. I pray for promises that have been spoken to come back forth in Jesus' name, to be remembered. I pray, God, that depression would be gone. I pray discouragement would be gone. I pray a new life would come forth in the name of Jesus. And God, I pray the increase of your government and of your peace would have no end in our lives this day. I just ask you in this moment, with your eyes closed, your head bowed, just for the sake of those around you. But if you're here today and you'd say, Pastor, you know that was me, that, that kind of spoke to where I'm at right now. I've been struggling a little bit with the direction in my life. I've been struggling with discouragement and depression in my life. I've been, I've been at this point wondering if God can still even use me or speak to me. If that's you, no one else looking around the room, would you just simply raise your hand that I might pray with you? Amen. Anyone else? Thank you. Put your hands down. Thank you. Father God, I pray for those now that raise their hands that they may know that you have called them by name. Not just a generic hey you, not just a general assumption, but that you have spoken their names specifically, Lord. That through the records of time, you have ordain their steps. And I pray, God, that may they go forward in strength and hope and joy today. Let depression, once again, be gone in the name of Jesus. And Lord, I pray, may your joy and your peace fill their lives overflow. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. I pray now for your church. I pray may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make His face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord watch over you and go out and as you come back in. And may the joy of the Lord throughout the season be your strength. In Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Merry Christmas.